Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the last day of reInvent. Wasn't that an exciting three days? How was the party last night? And I'm, thank you very much for showing up right on time, even after the party last night. <laughs> How many of you are flying back tonight? Oh, that's most of the room. So I think, you know, just remembered since I'm flying back as well, and we all have to thank Wright brothers for doing what they did, right, where they got started. Uh, I think, you know, on AWS side, we are kind of in a, in a similar situation. Um, Wright brothers were not the first one to try to fly. There were a lot of people who were trying at the same time or before that. But most of them were trying to do it in a way that they have seen things fly, right? How the birds fly, you know, that's what, that's what people have seen, how things fly. And I think Wright brothers were the first one to take a step back and think, oh, maybe there should be a different way to try this. And they tried a different way and fortunately that worked out so we can take the Boeings and Airbuses today to get home, right? So I think when it comes to AWS, um, we kind of need to do the same thing. Um, a lot of times people make the mistake of following the same path they used to follow before, because you know, we all come with our, from our backgrounds. We were, you know, I was doing uh, enterprise application implementations for like 20 years, so it's kind of like hardwired into my brain that this, this is how you do things, right? But when, I, when you come to AWS, we bring so much to the table, so many new capabilities, so many new ways of doing things, it's always important to kind of like take a step back and think, uh, what I'm doing, is it the right way to do? Or is there a better way to do? And believe me, there are a lot of better ways to do a lot of things, even your existing enterprise applications when you bring to AWS. So um, in the next 60 minutes, we will uh, look into why we, you would use AWS for disaster recovery, uh, some common DR architectures on AWS, and the most exciting part, we are not going to just tell you how to do DR on AWS, we are actually going to show you how to do DR on AWS. So have your mobile devices ready, you guys are going to do stuff, we are going to do some things here. I have my colleagues uh, uh, Vikram and Kamal here who are going to, you know, walk you through an exciting demo of actually doing DR failover, making things work. We'll look and do a little bit of code walkthrough because, you know, we want you to take this and, and implement it yourself for the price of a cup of coffee, you know, something like that. <laughs> and we'll uh, take a quick look at uh, um, some other um, DR architectures as well and, and uh, case study and see where you can go next. So how, how many of you have already a DR set up in your enterprise, in your, in your work? Good number of people. And you all know most companies do DR only for the most critical workloads, right? There is a reason for that, because this thing is pretty expensive, right? And the, the, the reason people do DR is if something goes wrong, you're not dead in the water. You can still you know, get up and run, your business is not stalled, you, you, you still have things going, right? But if things don't go wrong, fortunately, it's a good, good thing, if things go, don't go wrong, there is just dead money sitting there, right? The, the ROI is very low if everything goes right. So people who come up with the budgets for this and, and do the procurement and all that has this challenge of how do I balance this, you know? Let's say your, your, your production environment costs $10 million to implement. Keep in mind, this includes hardware and software. A lot of times, the software ending up costing more than the hardware itself. You know, think about the number of cores of licenses that you need to buy for the database and the application server and, and whatnot, right? So it, it all adds up. So let's say your production environment actually costs you $10 million to implement. And then people who spend money go through this debate of what should I do? And a lot of times come up to saying, okay, let's do it at a 50% scale, right? So now my DR environment is going to cost me $5 million. So if something goes wrong, we will 
we will continue working or performing at 50% of capacity as production. So by, you know, if it'll give us enough time to get back onto our production environment and, and continue as usual. So it's, oh, did I go forward too much? So because it's so expensive, normally this is done for only for most critical systems. But unfortunately, it's not only the most critical systems that fail, right? A lot of systems fail. And actually, the most critical systems probably fail less than the other systems because a lot of work went into the most critical systems, right? So when the other systems fail, which could be, you know, it's critical for business as well, but, you know, it's probably something that you can absorb for a few days, but it still costs money when systems go down and you are not able to perform what needs to be performed usually. And then um, I have seen people implementing DR across the street. Your data center is in this street and in a couple of blocks down your DR side. Um, I personally don't call it a disaster recovery. I think it's a disaster waiting to happen, right? <laughs> this thing works pretty well if somebody unfortunately, you know, pulled out a plug somewhere and your systems came down. But like we saw in New York and New Jersey, if there is a flood, and that whole area is underwater, you're out of luck, right? So in a good architecture, your DR site has to be in a remote region. And when you say remote region, this is a place where you don't have your data centers, right? You don't have a presence. That makes everything even more difficult. Now you need to reach out, find, you know, who are reliable people there, um, set things up there and probably fly people over periodically to make sure everything works fine. Again, making everything a lot more expensive. Uh, then I mentioned this previously as well, the software licenses. You are actually licensing your software based on the hardware you are using, right? So if you are at 50% scale for your DR, you're actually using 50, paying 50% 50 for your software as well. What time are you doing? Let's see what we can, how we can map this to AWS. If you are going to do your DR on AWS, what it will look like and what it will get you. To me, DR on AWS is a no-brainer migration. You know, there is so much, so many unprecedented capabilities that AWS brings to the table. It's, it's no way possible to do this on-prem in your data center. Just think about being sitting in your, on your, at your desk and being able to launch instances in Singapore or in Brazil or in Japan, right? So that, I think, is a really remote region, isn't it? So doing it on AWS allows you to actually cut down your costs up to 70%. You know, I didn't want it to throw in a bigger number I think it is even larger than that. Because if, once you look at our architecture, you know, you know how, we, uh, how we implement this. But 70% savings on that $5 million is quite a bit of money, right? $3.5 million that you can use for something else that you don't need to spend on DR. And probably using the DR side that is sitting there with your data for doing other things. So I mentioned this, we have nine regions across the globe. We have three regions in the United States plus the Gov Cloud. Then we have regions in, uh, we have a region in Brazil, we have Singapore, we have Sydney, and in Tokyo, Japan. So you, now this allows you to even have multiple DR sites, right? So let's say you are actually uh, based in, in Boston. So if you're, you have your, your own data center in Boston, you're running all your enterprise application out of your data center in Boston. Now, when you set up your DR site on AWS, I wouldn't recommend you do it on, in Virginia, in the East Coast. I would recommend you do it in the West Coast, right? In, in California or in, in Oregon. No, you don't really need to stop there. We have, you know, even from, from the president, we heard about the vulnerability of electric grid or whatnot, and then there are all these you know, climate changes that are going on. So there could be something big that could happen uh, which could bring down things across the country. But most of the businesses these days are global businesses, right? Just because 
uh, something happened here doesn't mean your business needs to stop and your customers need to suffer. So you could, you know, because of our global footprint and the low cost of implementing this, you can afford to have multiple DR sites now. You can probably have one in California and another one in Singapore or, or in Brazil. Makes everything even more easier. So this, these are um, four DR architectures that we highly recommend to our customers. Um, three of them are quite self-explanatory. You know, backup and restore. Then you have warm backup and restore. Is you backup into AWS, and if something goes wrong, you restore into AWS instances and, and EBS, and then continue with it. We'll look more detail into it. Then there is WAM standby where you have very similar setup like your production on AWS, but at a very, very scaled down size. And as needed, if something goes wrong, you'll scale up and be production ready. And then uh, hot standby where you have uh, high availability and exact replica of your production environment on AWS. Um, you can see the dollar signs there that shows you, you know, the range of costs. So you can see the least expensive is backup and restore, and the most expensive, obviously, is the hot standby, right? Of all these architectures, the one I really, really like is the pilot light. Uh, you can see it's kind of like well-balanced in cost. Uh, I, I, I think probably I should have used a few more uh, dollar signs in, in other places to show, you know, pilot light is actually a whole lot cheaper. So pilot light, uh, the name comes from the old uh, um, furnace technology, where if you shut down your furnace or the heater at home, it takes a while to actually light it back up and, and get it working and get heat back on. So to prevent that from happening, most of the um, furnaces for a long time had this tiny little flame in it that will be running all the time, though it is not actually burning gas, called the pilot light. So when you actually want the furnace to kick in, you don't ha it doesn't have to go through the, the, you know, everything from the very beginning to get ready. So, so you keep a tiny little light going, and when it's needed, you kick it off. In a little bit of time, everything comes up, right? For, for most enterprise DR scenarios, this works really, really well. So now why, why even talk about other DR scenarios, right? We have, I, I have four architectures here. It all depends on what you want to do. Maybe your, your application is so critical, you, have, you need to fail over to DR side within you know, milliseconds or seconds. You cannot wait for you know, even a few minutes. Then you probably want to go hard standby, right? And the other advantage of that is probably though you are not continuously using hard standby um, on a regular basis where your production is fine, you can probably use hot standby for other things like reporting and you know, data warehousing operations or whatever else. And this environment becomes your production environment when something goes wrong. So actually that cost can be justified. And then I told you, you, know, you, can, you can actually have multiple DR sites in different regions. And then you can pick and choose what kind of DR implementation you want to do for each one of them. Maybe let's say, like I said um, before, Let's say we are planning two DR sites, right? You are, you are based in Boston, you have a DR site in California, and you have a second DR site in Singapore, right? So for California, you can go for a pilot light. That is where you will always go the first time. And if something wrong with California, you can go to Singapore with backup and restore, right? So you have options. So the, uh, a small architecture uh, representation of how the DR is going to work. On the bottom right-hand side of your screen is your own data center. As you can see, um, you have your, your storage, your application and web servers, database server, uh, your DNS is right, routing currently to your web server. Everything is working fine, and you are running your business. And the left-hand top part of the screen is your DR setup in AWS. So you see there is only one instance running, right? That is our pilot light instance. So when you take your entire enterprise application architecture, the, what, is the, what is the most key component of your, your enterprise layout? 
let's say it out of those three things, web server, app server, and database server. Who can tell me which is the most key component? Database server, obviously, right? So everything else you can just bring up, but if you lose your data, you lose your database, you probably lose your business and probably lose your job, something like that, right? <laughs> so here what we are doing is we are we are taking that key component and replicating into the, your DR environment. So basically all we are doing is we have a tiny little instance, database instance running, and we'll use a replication software like Oracle Data Guard or, or you know, SQL Server's built-in replication or something like uh, third-party tools like uh, uh, DBVisit or, or Shareplex or Attunity, one of these things, or like Golden Gate, to replicate from your on-prem database to this database instance running on AWS, right? And then for everything else, we will create AMIs. You all, you all know what AMIs are. Those it's kind of like freeze-dried image of your instance. So basically, you will set up instances on AWS. You will have, this is not how it will look like you when you are building stuff, right? This is how your DR environment will look like when you are all done. So when you are building, you will actually have the exact same instance types as you have on-prem. You'll have an application server, you have a web server, you'll set it all up, you'll configure it, you make sure it works with the database. It's all, when it's all done, when it's all done, unlike in, in your own data center, you cannot return the servers that you bought, you cannot you know, throw away the servers that you bought. Here, you can throw away the instances, right? So once you are done with all the configuration, you cut AMIs out of it, you you know, give back the instances to us, you are done. Your, you know, your cost goes away. So now your cost is just running that tiny little database instance there. One of the things I recommend people do is have some scripts in place to periodically refresh those AMIs because your on-prem servers keep changing as well. You might do some patches, some updates, make sure, sure you, know, you keep those things synchronized so you have a schedule or, or kind of like on demand as you patch and update or do whatever to your on-prem servers, make sure you, you refresh those AMIs on AWS side as well. One other uh, best practice would be to have configuration files not directly as part of AMI, have as, you know, as part of uh, EBS. So you keep all the configuration files in EBS so you, you can you know, just snapshot them, or you can update them to S3, where your AMI, when it comes up, it pulls it out from S3. So, so that is your um, DR environment at rest when you are not, you know, when, when everything is going fine. And now com compare this to your DR environment currently, where everything in, in your DR looks exactly like what you have in production, right? So the cost of running this is going to be extremely small compared to what you have. So when something goes wrong, uh, wrong, this is what you do. You'll have scripts that kick in. This is how it is today. When something goes wrong, you'll have scripts that will kick in. It'll bring up those application server and web server uh, instances from the AMIs, and the database server size goes up. See, we had a, we had a, a smaller database before, right? This, is, this was our database instance. As we fail over, our database instance gets bigger. That is your production size now, and your application server comes up, and your web server comes up. Now this, and you switch your DNS, now to point to your instances running on AWS. You are back in business. So just, just to summarize how this works, you know, build your build your resources around replicated data set because that is the key component, right? Once you have the data, you can do everything else around it. So build your resources around the replicated data set. Keep the tiniest instance possible for your database. Now, why do I keep saying keep the tiniest instance? Of course, you know, we want you to pay us less money. You know, that's how we work. That's one part of it. The other part of it is a lot of... Um, I, I mentioned it many times because this is something I want to carry with you because a lot of pe times when people think about DR, people think only about hardware, right? You need licenses for the software running in that thing, and that is pretty expensive. In a lot of times, it's more expensive than the hardware itself. So just remember that always. 
And most of the time, you are actually paying licenses for software based on the capacity of the hardware you are running on, right? And, and a lot of uh, software vendors are nice enough to let you run your DR with your production license many times. This is if you are failing over to DR. But if you have a DR environment always running, you need to pay licenses for whatever is running there, right? So let's, let's take a look at our old scenario where you are running at 50% scale, right? At 50% scale, you are actually paying licenses for 50% of the hardware of your production. Whereas here, you're actually paying licenses for a very tiny little amount. Let's say you are running on a two-core machine for the uh, Oracle database. Now you are actually buying license for the two cores of Oracle database, right? So once um, something goes, uh, you, you build things on AWS to scale up and scale out as needed in case of DR. And when something goes wrong, you'll just switch over to DR, make the necessary DNS changes, and re redirect your traffic to AWS. Now let's take a look at how it all going to work. And for that, have uh, Vikram here. Vikram. So have your mobile devices ready to go to some uh, URLs. Thanks, Abdul. Can you guys hear me okay? okay. I know disaster recovery, recovering from a disaster is painful, and recovering from previous night's party is equally painful. I don't know how many of you are in my situation. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, you know, what we thought we would do, you know, based on you know Abdul's uh, talk here, you know, we learned how we can set up disaster recovery um, in various regions. You know, AWS provides you this completely disconnected uh, regions uh, for you to work with. Uh, within availability zones, the construct is we have redundant power. Uh, redundant internet providers, our availability zones are on different earthquake plates. So we make sure there is continuity and high availability in case of an availability zone goes away for any reasons, and your application tends to be highly available. Uh, but with, from a disaster recovery standpoint, you want your applications to be um, geographically in a separate location, um, basically east or west, um, uh, and and have them running in the event of disaster. And we have seen quite a few disasters happen already. You know, there was a power grid failure, there, were, there are storms that can happen, or even something happened to your own internal systems. You know, maybe some, you know, some applications that are unstable and you would like to fail over for, uh, to meet your uh, RPO and RTO timelines and so on. So a lot of, a lot of options there. So what we thought, we would, we would basically demo with a simple application. Um, so one of the customers approached me and said, hey, you know, we, you know, I, I want an application uh, to be built using AWS, obviously, and I want it to be highly available, and at the same time, I also want to make sure I don't lose any data in the event of a disaster. Um, so I thought, okay, great. Um, and, and, and then the application is basically a, a poll, simple online poll application, and, and, and this is because this is for an elections. Um, so I decided to start off with building my architecture um, in the uh, US East, um, I've set up basically a load balancer, um, created my uh, web and app servers there. Um, it's a pretty simple application where you know, I have some code where I, I have a questionnaire and the web page comes up with the questions and then the users enter the data and I capture the results and then I send the results downstream to another third party system which is not represented here. Um, and I, you know, I have Oracle licenses with me, so why not? You know, I, instead of using MySQL or other database, I want it to be a highly scalable database. Um, and I also want the features like DataGuard for replication uh, instead of my own you know, replication tools. Um, so I, I decided to use the Oracle database. Um, so you know, I got all this set up. You know, it's good, tested it, working fine. Now, in the event of a disaster, what are my options? How do I, you know, how do I accomplish that? So once I've done my application, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've created an AMI, which is pretty stable configuration, so I don't have any further patches or releases, and it's golden image, like per se. I copied my AMI, you know, have it there sitting in the other region. You know, I don't have any instances running off of the AMI because I don't, I don't need to pay for it. My application may require 20 to 30 application server, web server instances in the US East region for my live site, but I'm not using my US West site as an active region, not even an active passive. So it's, it's, it's 
mostly passive. Um, and the reason why I'm not running instances there is uh, fundamentally goes back to one of the talks that Abdul mentioned um, on cost. So how do I decide when I choose to run instances, when I don't, um, and why am I even doing a setup of a data replication there? The variables that drive these are basically your RPO, RTO, and cost. So in my case, my recovery time objective, and I told customer, hey, you know, if something goes bad, give me 15 minutes. That's my recovery time. That's when the site is going to be live back again, right? Recovery point: How much data can I can I lose? Uh, afford to lose, right? Is this is this something that I can, you know, lose maybe 100,000 words? Um, is that okay? Or you know, is it a big deal? And my customers like, I can't lose any data. I mean, it could it should be pretty close to, um, to to what it is when you know once the data is logged in into the database, I, you know, we can't lose the data. So there are, I, th I thought about a few options here. Um, so you know, the options are, instead of setting up a replication, um, I could look at doing backups, right? You know, S3 is highly scalable, obviously, so I can take an Oracle database backup as a full backup one time, and then do incremental backups every half an hour, every 30 minutes, right? That gives me the recovery point of a 30-minute past data. Now, that's one option where, you know, if I don't want to run an Oracle instance, in this case, I chose to set up a slave in another region and set up data card uh, for a replication. So it's an asynchronous replication. So the, the odds are that you know, I get most of the data and I meet my recovery point objectives. But I still pay some cost for that, which is fine. Again, like I said, the three variables that you need to look at when you talk to your customers and, uh, or your, your disaster recovery scenarios are RPO, RTO, and cost. And AWS incredibly provides a, a very cheaper options for you to, to be able to do that. So copied my AMI, and I have set up a replication. Nice little animation there. So in the event of a disaster, so we, are, we all know, you know we have to switch to the other zone. So what are the things that I'm doing? So if you look at from a Route 53 standpoint, um, we're doing the DNS failover. So Route 53 obviously runs from um, our edge locations as well, along with regions. So in the event of a region goes away, our Route 53 has 100% SLA, and it continues to run in all edge locations, and it replicates DNS across the globe. Um, so it will be up and running. Um, and, and we, um, you know, we, uh, you know, I basically launch a load balancer um, in, the, in the West, and I also launch my application servers and web servers um, in the other region and set up an auto-scaling policy to quickly scale up to meet the production demand as I receive the production demand. And you know, I'm, you know, I have a database server which is already active anyway, so my application servers can directly connect to it. Uh, but one thing I need to do is as my production load increases, I'm going to have to increase the size of the, um, the Oracle database. Because all, all, these, all this time I've been running this on an on a M1.small type instance. All it needs is to receive asynchronous replication data coming in from master. Beyond that, it's not doing much. So why would I need to run it on an extra large or a CC type instance you know, to pay addition? I, I just chose to run it on a small, but now that the production traffic's going to go, um, I would like to scale it up. Uh, so there's a scale up event. The whole process you know, could take probably around 10 to 15 minutes, and that is what I promised my customer as my recovery time. So putting it all this together, uh, what we have done um, is you know, we have the entire architecture, the, the pieces that we have seen before uh, with VPC. So I chose to set up a VPC, obviously, public subnet and a private subnet from a uh, database standpoint. Um, and if you look at on the right, there is another, one additional piece here called failover application. And you know, this is something that um, you know, Kamal is an awesome developer, and I said, Kamal, hey, we need to build this application. And, and he said, OK, great. And you know, he put together uh, some scripts, and then he put together a cloud formation template and helped me with uh, with running a, um, a failover application. And what this application does is, you know, obviously I'm going to have to run it in a region where um, it is not primary, so we chose to run it in the West. Um, and in the event of a disaster, um, I expect my sysadmins to go to this application, log in and say, okay, now I'm ready to failover, click the button, and then the process should happen. And that's what we're going to do today as well. So uh, Kamal, uh, maybe we should jump into the console and quickly show what we have from a setup standpoint. I think it's good to see the architecture as well. Um, so which region are we in? Okay, so in US East region, do you have a monitor here? Yes. Okay. 
In the US East region, um, this, these are my running instances. So I have a based in host, which is a very good practice for you. Instead of exposing your database servers, app servers publicly out to the internet, um, I chose to set up a remote desktop gateway um, and then log into that. And from there, I can get to my internal network. Um, so reducing the surface area there. Um, and I have two web servers. Uh, one of them is running in US East 1A and the other one in US East 1C. And, and then my uh, Oracle database server. Um, if you go to the AMI catalog on the left, um, I have my AMI here, my web server AMI. Beyond that, I don't need any other additional resources for running. Um, and I chose to, you know, Amazon provides you the ability to copy AMIs from one region to the other region. So within the, under the Actions tab, um, you can pick and uh, you can select the uh, AMI and then say copy AMI, uh, and then it would ask you the target region, and you can automatically just copy within, I think, roughly around 15, 20 minutes, you should have your AMI up and uh, set up in the other region. So I've chose that um, to, to, to transfer my web server. Um, so let's jump to the, um, our disaster recovery, uh, recovery region and then see what we have running there. Um, so we have, we have a couple of things running uh, in terms of uh, uh, the setup. Uh, we have an Oracle database secondary, obviously, at the bottom. Um, and we have, our, um, we have two applications. One is the DR failover app and the DR status app. Uh, these are completely outside of my application. Those are purely utility applications that are designed to help me um, recover from disaster. And those could be, you know, you could use those applications for any of the other, not only for this specific application, but for anything else. And we'll give away, give away the code and template and whatnot so you can take it and customize it uh, for your uh, scenarios as well. Uh, we can probably jump back to the slide. All right, um, so, so we have this de demo uh, set up, and we, this domain is live. So if you could you know, use your laptops or mobile applications, can go in and take the poll. Um, so this is the application. We have a little architecture diagram as well. Uh, we could, you know, add, as, you, as you guys get there and, and start taking the votes, we'll, uh, we can go check the results as well. I don't know how many of you are able to get to that. The one important thing on this uh, that if you see, um, I have listed the availability zone and then the instant instance ID that this particular um, application is being served from. So this could be a little different uh, for you. So this, you could be seeing US East 1C or 1A, depending on what load balancer choose to serve you. Uh, how many of you, uh, did anybody get to the application by any chance? Okay, how many of you are seeing the same one that I'm seeing, the availability zone as 1C? Um, anything different than 1C? Okay, a few of them. So my load balancer is load balancing between two instances, one in 1C and the other one in another availability zone. Uh, so depending on which, which instance you are hitting, you would see the, um, the value for that zone and then the instance ID is different. So yeah, looks like we're getting considerable amount of polls there. Um, so great, um, so this is, um, this is nice. So let's look at, Jump to the next slide. Uh, so we have set up an application for failover.aws.com, um, and then we also have set up a live status uh, for you to see the status. So um, Kamal, why don't we, uh, I think we should basically go ahead and kick off our disaster recovery. So this is the disaster recovery application um, UI that we have set up. Um, so we need to basically log in. Um, since this is you know, uh, an internal system, we would like our sysadmins to be able to uh, go in there and log. Something happened at this point, maybe the power outage or whatever happened, I would like to um, go ahead and uh, maybe you wanna kill one of the um, two web servers there on the US East. Maybe that's, that's a disaster, right? So killing, killing our own web servers without having an auto-scaling policy is, is bad. So in this case, I did not set up an auto-scaling policy. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and kill. Um, right that, yeah, looks like we, we lost our site. Um, so it's time for us to do the, do the failover. All right, um, I give you the full permission to do it. All right, so, um, so you also can take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, if you go to the URL, status.drdemo.com, so there are, there's a process that goes on. 
and I'll talk about the process, uh, what's going on behind the scenes, and we'll take a look at the application, and we'll also go take a look at the console. Um, and then I'll probably, in the meantime, while it is doing it, you could monitor on your, uh, on your devices as well, and I'll go through the presentation. Uh, since my recovery time is anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, so I have that time, um, so my customer's not gonna be uh, yelling at me until then. Um, beyond that, um, I'll have to see if I have a job or not. All right, so. All right, so the, the first thing we did is basically we launched the failover application. Um, so, and then we, um, the, the activities that we need to do here is to, we need to make sure our uh, DNS updates are done. Since AWS DR demo is a uh, live URL, we need to make sure that the, um, the Route 53 updates, DNS upsets, updates are done. I know I'm running a small instance uh, in another region, so I'm gonna have to resize uh, the target database instance. Um, and you have seen, I'm just, I just have an AMI in the other region, so obviously I need to launch my web servers from that EMI, make sure those um, web servers are um, attached to the load balancer, which I'm going to launch as well. Um, and then finally, um, I have to give thumbs up, um, you know, after doing a sanity check for, for a go live. So here is the um, architecture for the failover application. The step one, we triggered the procedure. So the failover app is going to uh, invoke a script, shell script, um, using the AWS command line utilities. Uh, and the shell script's gonna do a couple of updates, including like RDS, using RDS command line tool to resize the database and whatnot. Um, and then it also sends us the notifications, which some of that we, um, you guys are going, seeing on the status application if you are monitoring that right now. Um, and then we also launch a cloud formation. And a cloud formation template does few things, uh, which we'll look at the code. How many of you here are familiar with cloud formation? Awesome. So cloud formation is an excellent tool. Uh, just for those folks who are not familiar with, it's a deployment management tool. Um, and you can basically configure um, your infrastructure uh, in a simple JSON format, meaning you can you know, create a template and say, okay, I want you know, X number of web servers from this AMI, and I would like these web servers to be launched in a VPC, um, and I want um, these security groups to be created and um, these ports to be open. You know, all this can be done manually by going to console or using the command line utilities. But if you want to do this repeatedly and you want to create multiple environments of the same infrastructure, maybe a dev environment for certain things, a QA environment and, and a production environment, and you want that repeatability built uh, in how you set up your infrastructure, cloud formation is an excellent choice. And we have hundreds of templates available on our website as a starting point, even you know, simplest things like launching you know, a content management system with two web servers and a database to complicated SharePoint deployments, Exchange server deployments, and so on. So I highly recommend um, you take a look at those templates and, and start using the, um, the cloud formation as a tool for, for setting up your infrastructure. And it also helps if you've done something on, in one region and you can take the same template and run it exactly um, in another region and it's gonna set up the same infrastructure. You may have to change some AMI IDs and whatnot depending on how mapping is set up and some variables here and there, but fundamentally you'll have exact same infrastructure in every region um, if you're using the cloud formation template. So in this case, we chose to use the cloud formation template because we wanna reuse it. Um, and if you wanna set up in another region as well, you know, we could just take that and do it. So that's basically the failover application architecture. And this is, you know, this has nothing to do with my, my mainstream application, which is the PO. Um, this is purely my infrastructure utility application that, I, that we have created to work with to do the failover. Um, few things um, in the code, so don't worry about reading the entire code. We'll make it available for you um, as well, and you know, uh, it, will be, um, um, it will be online as well. Um, so the, the uh, information of, of showing the availability zone and instance ID, um, where am I getting that information from, right? And so I wrote that the application is written in .NET, um, and this is a simple code snippet of how I can use the HTTP web request object to get to the, um, the URL, the 169.254.169.254. So this is a reserved um, you know, IP address which you can use from your instances to retrieve metadata. So whether you have you know, uh, NAT set up or uh, internet gateway set up or, or you know, it could be anything. As long as you are making this HTTP request um, within the AWS infrastructure, um, you'll be able to receive the metadata for the instance. So in this case, 
um, I am requesting the metadata for availability zone. Um, so you, you have options for requesting a lot of other uh, metadata information about your running instance. So I've used that uh, in my application to display the availability zone and the instance ID. And the next thing we did is um, we, uh, within the shell script, we are uh, taking the uh, domain name uh, and then the hosted zone ID. We hard coded these two variables. I mean, you could also make it parameterized to make it work with different domains and different uh, hosted zone IDs. Um, so we are basically taking the zone ID uh, in the Route 53, and we need to switch. We need to remove the existing elastic load balancer reference um, to the, uh, remove that reference and then add the new elastic load balancer that we are going to set up in the US West region. So you know, our ELB that's in the US East is completely gone, so we are now working with the ELB that's on the West. The next thing is uh, resizing the, uh, uh, the database instance. And a simple command um, to go ahead and use the EC2 modify instance um, uh, in, within the target region, which says m1.small. Um, actually, we, we, we are using a different instance type than m1.small. Uh, but um, this is the command to, to be able to go ahead and resize the uh, database instance. Um, and then launching the cloud formation stack. So in this case, the cloud formation stack works with um, you know, a few things. It sets up an auto-scaling policy in my target region. Um, it also launches the web servers from my AMI that I have copied and set up. Um, and then it also publishes the notifications um, can we quickly see where we are on the status? Um, does it say done? Not yet. Okay. So here is our uh, cloud formation template. Uh, we um, it's it's obviously um, quite long, so this it's, uh, and it's not readable. So don't worry about it. We'll make it available for you to to be able to download and take a look at it. Um, just a few things: um, setting up the uh, the parameters uh, for those who are not familiar with the cloud formation. Um, so let me go back quickly. And um, the way the, the, the cloud formation structured is, you know, you have you know, standard headers that defines the runtime that the cloud formation engine is going to use, um, and you have parameters. Um, so you could define parameters could be your your keys that you use to launch instances, or usernames and passwords that you may want to uh, pass in as parameters to the cloud formation template. So anything, you know, the instance type, anything that you want to customize within the template, you could set them up as parameters. Uh, we provide you the mapping section to, to be able to map. For example, if you want to map certain things based on region, um, then you'd be able to do that. Or if you want to mace, map something based on the architecture type, like a 32-bit or a 64-bit, um, and pick up the right functions, then right values, then use the mapping section. And resources are basically everything that AWS has, offer, has to offer. For example, VPC is a resource. EBS volume is a resource. EC2 instance is a resource. So there are so many AWS resources to work with, um, and you could use, you know, you could define those resources you know, in terms of either creating um, or, or adding additional resources in the resources section, and, and finally the outputs um, is where um, you would capture the data from the cloud formation template uh, into into an output output value basically or or something that to print out um, in terms of a code. Uh, so this is how you know fundamentally a a template is structured. So parameters, um, this is you know, where you ask for values. Uh, you define, um, so in this case, you know, key pair name is the parameter uh, description uh, to help with you know, what that um, input name is and then the type of the variable uh, that you are going to ask for. Um, and then if you see the, in the second parameter, which is instance type, um, you have the option of specifying allowed values, meaning you know, it, it's not a drop down type, but you could force uh, some validation uh, by making sure that only those values are entered by the user when they're entering the values for the parameters. And then I have our own custom uh, parameters like host zone ID and all, which are the application dependent. Um, and within the cloud formation resources section, um, I talked about the resources where we define our resources. So I'm setting up a, um, an auto scaling group um, in an availability zone in the West, obviously with a minimum size configuration and a max size configuration um, so that the auto scale group looks at the number of instances that are, uh, that are running. And then if it doesn't see that the total count of instances is not two, it immediately launches the instances from the AMI uh, within that 
subnet that I have defined there. Um, so that's setting up a basic minimum auto scaling group with min and max will help me to get to the minimum um, configuration of the, the having at least two web servers in you know one in each availability zone to start off with. Of course, in addition to that, I can also set up additional auto scaling policies to meet my production traffic. And those auto scaling policies could be based on you know, CPU or request count or various other parameters, or maybe you know, based on something that happens on Friday or the weekend or depending on my application and so on. I have a lot of options there. But from just having a basic application availability standpoint, I chose to set up um, at least one instance in each of the availability zones. So let's look at the status. All right, so, um, so from a activity standpoint, in terms of launching the shell script, resizing the database, launching the cloud formation template, and then cloud formation template in turn launching the instances, I think most of it is done. Is that come off? Is that true? It's all done. It's all done. Um, so the last thing that we need to do, uh, wait for, is the DNS failover. Right? It's not something that in my control. So I'm going to have to wait for global DNS servers to sync. And in some cases, oh, it synced? OK, yesterday it didn't. It, it took like 20 minutes for me to um, have the DNS updated. But in this case, it looks like um, we're good. Um, um, so if you look at your, the application now, you'll see the availability zone as US West 1C. Um, and then your instance ID is um, obviously going to be different. And some of you might be getting another availability zone. Um, did we launch two? You, we launched two web servers, right? Two are inactive. Let's go check in the console what's going on. So we have the ELB there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we have two web servers now, which weren't there before, um, active. And we have the load balancer um, that is set up, uh, which is now mapped to the new uh, DR uh, domain that we have set up. Um, so it looks like everything's up and running, and I have met my recovery time objective. Did we meet the recovery point objective as well? Is the data there in the? OK, yeah, looks like we have the data here, too. So we are live. So um, I get to keep my job. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was awesome, Thank you. wasn't it? All right. So now, one of the things you can do is, you know, sometimes when people do demos, they, they say, don't try this at home. I say, hey, go try it at home. And, and one, um, you know, when I, when I tell people about enterprise migrations, I always start with DR, because this is a low-hanging fruit. And it is very easy to try out. So when you, when you need to migrate your production to AWS, you cannot do, run production in two places, right? So that's quite risky. You need to plan things out. Whereas you can have multiple DR sites. You have your you know, $50 million DR sites running on in production in, in your data centers now. Go try out this DR site for $10 and see how it works, right? So what, what Vikram and uh, Kamal did was they had both their primary and DR on AWS itself. Right? So that is one of the use patterns. So once you move over your production to AWS, you still want to set up a DR site. So you could have your production and DR in AWS, or you could have production just like what you're having today. You, know, you are running everything in your own data center on-prem, so you are keeping your production there. Uh, probably you want to keep it forever, or maybe you know, someday you want to move it on to AWS. But today, you keep everything as it is and, and have your DR site on AWS. So here is an um, architecture diagram for, for uh, just a database, running a database on AWS with it, uh, your primary on AWS as well as your DR site on AWS. No, I'll go back if you want to take a picture. But you, know, you are all going to get a nice PDF of the whole deck next Wednesday, and everybody who attended the session. And uh, obviously, you know, the, the PDF is not going to have our nice looking faces, so if you miss us, we are going to be probably end up in our AWS channel on YouTube as well. So if you haven't checked out our channels on YouTube, uh, we have an AWS channel on YouTube and AWS channel on SlideShare. So there's tons of information there. And I know a lot of people like watching videos than reading documents these days. 
So now let's look up, uh, look at uh, a cheaper, even simpler option. Like I told you, you know, you could have multiple options depending on the environment. Maybe you want to you want to do this for your development environments or some reporting environments. You can have backup and restore, and for you know uh, live mission critical production environments, you can have warm standby and uh, secondary environments. You can have uh, pilot light. Though I think pilot light will work for most of the things. The best thing about backup and restore is it's very simple to get started. You have to backup things anyway, right? We in the past past one year on in Amazon. We migrated from backing up our databases to tape to backing them up to S3. So it's like a one-year project. You know, Amazon.com being one of the largest e-tailer, um, you know, how much data is being generated and being used. So it's still tons of data, tape assembly or robotic assemblies, a lot of money to invest. We moved all that data into S3, so that's where it's all residing now. So this is an easy thing for you to do, start moving data to S3 as your backup. Once it gets to S3, the data is available. Now you can put together the architecture around it, create the AMIs and whatnot to get, uh, set that up as your um, DR architecture. So this is how the DR architecture looks like for the backup and restore uh, pattern. Again, the bottom right hand of the screen, you have your uh, data center. At the top, you have S3. 11 nines of durability, the files that you put are going to be available you know, when you want them. And just like in the pilot light scenario, we are going to create AMIs in this case as well. So everything I, I told you about there applies here as well. So we create all the AMIs. One difference here is we are actually going to create AMI for the database instance as well, right? Earlier we had AMIs created for, uh, for uh, app and web server instances. Here we'll keep and uh, create and keep the uh, in, uh, AMIs for database instances as well. And if something goes wrong, you will just bring up the whole environment. So what is, what is the main difference here? Two things. One, this is going to be a whole lot cheaper because you, know, you are not running any instances or you are not even paying for the tiny little database instance. And more importantly, you are not paying for the license of the database running on that tiny little instance. For that tiny little instance, probably you'll be paying us like 20 bucks a month or something. But your license could still be like you know, $100,000, right? <laughs> <coughs> Probably more, you know, depending on how many cores you are running. So, <clears throat> like I said, so you will pick and choose the ar architecture that you want to implement based on which environment, <clears throat> which environment you want to set up your DR for. So, probably for the most critical environments, you'll probably go for Pilot Light or Warm Standby, and for less critical tier two, you can go for this because this is much cheaper. And the second difference is this is going to take a little longer to come up because now. You need to bring up your database instance and you have to restore the database, right? Just too dry. <coughs> so when it comes to backing up to AWS, there are many different ways you can do it. <coughs> you use database utilities like RMAN to back up your Oracle database. Or you know, there are tons of uh, applications available outside from third parties which will do the same thing. And for the files, you can use AWS Storage Gateway. Probably most of you have heard of our AWS Storage Gateway. It creates like a cache drive on-prem, <coughs> makes it available as a SCSI drive that you can write to. So it'll look like a storage volume on-prem, just like a disk. So you write everything to that storage volume and the storage gateway will you know, asynchronously transfer those files to AWS S3. So the files automatically get up to S3, they get backed up. This might not be the best way to back up your database to S3, so I, uh, I would recommend you use database tools to back up your database to S3. But for files, uh, AWS a storage gateway is a very nice, very easy way of getting it done. Then, then you know, any of those myriads of tools that you use in your enterprise to, to back up 
uh, currently can be used with S3 as well, including semantic, you know, backup exec or, or net backup or, or com vault or, or CA backup utilities, you know, uh, then there's, then there are van accelerated uh, backup utilities like uh, riverbed whitewater. So you can, all of these now work with S3. So you can use any of these to backup to AWS. So once you d are done with your backup, you, once you do the first backup in your migration, and then you have to continuously do this, right? It'll be kind of like a, a, an ongoing operation. And you can decide how you want to do it, how frequently you want to do it. Like um, what Vikram mentioned, so there is going to be, that is going to be based on your recovery point objective, how much late, how much data you can kind of like, uh, you know, keep back when your DR environment comes up. So again, to, to iterate, you can have your primary site on AWS, or you can primary site on on-prem itself and replicate to AWS. So this is an example of how one of our customer has set up their DR operations in AWS. So this, in this case, they are using MySQL and a whole bunch of uh, web and uh, web-based applications. So keep in mind, you know the the DR side is not just for like PeopleSoft or or SAP or eBusiness Suite, right? You can do this for everything for your content management system, you know, for your portals. Whatever you are using, uh, whether it is open source that you're using with MySQL database or Oracle PeopleSoft you are using with, with Oracle database or, or SAP you are using with uh, SQL Server, the process is the same. The architecture is the same. Right? So that concludes our presentation. I'll uh, thank, want to thank all of you to show up here on time and be patient with me. Uh, I'd really appreciate if you can fill up the, the feedback, and, and hopefully this was beneficial for you.